um, when I started this project, I wanted to know what had happened to make it possible to ignore heterosexual misery to such an extent that this discourse about the easefulness of heterosexuality could continue um, and, and persist in this way. And I also wanted to know how had lesbian feminist feelings about the tragedy of heterosexuality and, and also the queer joy and relief that so many of us feel to have escaped straight culture. Why was it so hard with, with, for people with these feelings to get a word in edgewise? So part of the answer I explore in, um, in chapters two and three of the book is that heterosexual misery can't be fully recognized because misery itself was romanticized by 20th century physicians, sexologists, and psychologists who wrote a number of influential um, marriage manuals uh, or marriage advice books that attached self-sacrifice and suffering to modern heterosexuality. Uh, so in these chapters, I argue that these peddlers of marital advice built a self-help empire designed to smooth out the contradictions between the misogyny that they thought was a natural impulse in men and the new model of companionate marriage that emerged in the early 20th century. And one way that they tried to smooth out this contradiction between men's hatred of women uh, and modern heterosexuality's expectation that men like women was to make disappointment and sacrifice its own kind of heterosexual badge of honor um, or a way of securing sentimental belonging in the new category of straight personhood, of modern straight personhood. Um, another part of the answer though about the unwillingness to name the tragedy of heterosexuality has to do with the persistent marginalization of lesbian feminists in mainstream gay rights discourse. Uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, lesbian feminists like Adrian Rich, Audre Lorde, Cherry Moraga, and Gloria Anzaldúa all made clear that while being straight was largely beneficial for men, the same was often not true for women, especially women of color, for whom the institution of heterosexuality had been a site of violence, control, and um, diminishment. But gay men's own misogyny and their hoarding of the power to define the politics of queerness, uh, alongside the devastation of the AIDS epidemic that redirected lesbian organizing toward care of gay men instead of solidarity with straight women. All of these factors meant that lesbian feminist concerns about straight women's suffering pretty much dropped out of what would become queer political discourse. And, you know, still today, misogyny is very rarely ever meaningfully scrutinized in mainstream gay rights discourse. So the reasonable suggestion that women stand to gain more than they lose by extracting themselves from straight culture, this has become nearly impossible to hear amidst the chorus of born this way. So I, I wanted to write a book that would center lesbian feminist analysis in a way that could bring heterosexual suffering back to the foreground. And I wanted to show that when we hold the relationship between misogyny and heterosexuality in full view, we're able to see beyond this male-centric claim that queerness constitutes a, a tragic and unwilled loss of power. And instead, um, you know, like shift our sympathetic gaze back onto heterosexuality itself. I also wanted to offer lesbian feminism to straight couples, um, not in the form of political lesbianism or in the um, early L word sense of being a straight man trapped in a lesbian body. I don't know if you remember that from the from the first go round with that terrible show, but I, I wanted to offer it as a kind of methodology of humanizing lust um, or uh, like a roadmap for how to desire women so much, so unstoppably that you just, you cannot help but hunger for women's collective freedom. Um, in the book, I call this learning to like women so much that you actually like women. And this is what the last chapter of the book is about. Um, so 
I think I'm going to end there because I'm mostly just so excited to hear what Angela <laughs> thinks about all of this. Thanks, Jane. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you to Crystal and Jane and everyone at UCR um, for inviting me to be here. I'm so excited and have been all week. Um, I think, and first and foremost, Jane, thank you for writing this book. Um, so Jade and I talked about kind of the format here. Um, and so we discussed that I would spend a little bit of time talking with all of you about what I loved about the book. Um, and I'll try to keep that brief because there's a lot that I loved. Um, and then Jane and I'll do a little back and forth and have some conversation. Um, so I'll start with saying, I don't know about everybody in the audience um, and what you've been doing to survive the 2020 hellscape, um, but I've been reading a lot, right? Like as in books, not shade. And right now, like I needed this book. And so if you haven't re read this book, I think you need to, right? It is smart. Uh, the analysis is thought provoking, but y'all like I laughed a lot. Like honestly, mostly at the expense of cishet dudes, but like I laughed <laughs> a lot. And I really enjoyed it. And if I'm being honest with all of you, um, it spoke to me personally, right? Like I have a confession. Are, are we recording this? I'm kidding. Um, in my lifetime, I have actually enjoyed sexual relationships with cis men, right? Clutches pearls. Um, but, but here's the thing. I refuse to be a maid to a partner. I've never done sex work for free. I won't be a parent if they ain't my kid, right? As a black feminist, queer, you know, non-binary, aggressive femme, right? All of that. I refuse to enter into any relationships that are predicated on my presumed inferiority or whose power arrangements means my partner's pleasures and well-being are far more important than mine. Or like I could go on, but fuck that noise. So this book resonated with me not only as an intellectual and an academic with investments in scholarship and sexualities and gender and race, but as someone who has made a conscious choice to reject the tragedy that is heterosexuality. So if you haven't read this book yet, here's why I think you need to. Um, so as Jane was talking a little bit about, I think, you know, like not gay, I suspect that lots of non-academics will read this book. Um, and I think it can help shift how many people think about sexualities, especially straight ones, right? That is, this book is an in-depth examination of straight culture, not straight sex. Um, so sure, lots of cis straight people, especially straight women, have bad, unsatisfying straight sex. By the way, bookmark that and let's talk about that later. But the tragedy is not only about the tragedy of heterosexuality as sex, right? But as Jane was explaining, as a culture, right? At its core, the tragedy of heterosexuality is rooted in what Jane calls the misogyny paradox, right? Boys and men's desires for girls and women is expressed within a culture that encouraged them to also hate girls and women. So straight culture with its restricted gender roles and endless limits of ritual, rituals and rites of passage, right? It's patriarchal. Is sexist, cis sexist, it's white supremacist, right, and so forth. You know, these systems are deeply ingrained in what it means to be straight. And so straight culture makes many straight folks miserable. Thus, I was also drawn to the argument that homophobia is the outward expression of heterosexual misery. Here's what Jane says, quote, a kind of subconscious jealous rage against the gendered and sexual possibilities that lie beyond the violence and disappointments of straight cult culture. Added to this anger is also an unspoken sadness, a chilling cloud of resignation that is palpable and sometimes repellent ingredient of the affect of straight culture. Ouch, straight people. Um, I also want to note that this book, like Jane's other work, does much to advance feminist and queer methods. And those interested in queer methods must check out the chapter A Sick and Boring Life in particular, which I think masterfully anticipates and addresses critiques about so-called methodological rigor. Right? I especially love the idea of this chapter as, quote, an ethnography of my social and political milieu reflecting 
my feminist queer social network and kinds of conversations that happen within it, right? Like I wholeheartedly agree that methodological critiques are too often a reflection of readers feeling threatened by new or critical methods and ideas. Um, and I'd add that, you know, such critiques often reveal people's own investments in colonialist, white, elitist academic conventions. And frankly, their dismissiveness reveals their anti-Blackness, their anti-queerness, and so on. There's more. Um, moreover, I appreciated the nuanced attention to how the culture industry sells publics, books, films, a vast array of products and services, right? All predicated on the idea that men and women are fundamentally different want fundamentally different things out of heterosexuality such that their relationships are inherently and continually filled with conflict, misunderstanding, and downright contempt for one another, right? Throughout the book, I kept thinking, this is also a story about capitalism, right? Especially when I got to the pickup artist chapter, I was like, these men are paying what? A $4,000 weekend seduction training, a month long training for $2,000, right? But more than just attention to how capitalists exploit straight culture for monetary gain, Jane does something more astute, right? Especially when considering these seduction industries, she points to, quote, the capacity of neoliberal projects like the self-help movement to repackage and monetize feminist ideas, reducing them to matters of self-interest in economic exchange. So put another way, the heterosexual repair industry draws from feminist ideas and writing about consent, male privilege, hegemonic masculinity, toxic masculinity, right, to help men be more empathetic and attuned to women's needs, but really their rebirth is about them getting laid, becoming more manly, gaining more status, right? Like these businesses co-opt, right, ready for this? They co-opt feminist ideals to help men and not at all make them better partners to women. So again, I could go on with far more things that I love about the book, but I, I wanted to kind of go over some of what I think are the core ideas there. So um, I have many questions, um, but I wanted to ensure that, you know, you, the audience gets um, time to pick um, Jane's brain as well. And so I'm basically just going to ask three broad questions. Um, and so the first, I'd love to start talking about race and white supremacy. Um, in the pickup artist chapter, you directly call out the seduction industries as white supremacists, right? As they focus primarily on seducing white women. Um, and then you talk about when they address men of color's desires for white women in particular, the coaches often suggest that they make a joke like of their racial differences. Um, throughout the book, um, you discuss the trope of black women as strong, aggressive, resilient, sassy heroines and super women, you know, who effectively show white women, Hugh Gloria Gaynor, how to survive gross men and the harm they often cause. So I wonder if there's more you can say to the audience or discuss about the entanglements of the tragedy of heterosexuality and white supremacy. Absolutely, thank you so much, Angela. If I'm being awkward, it's because I can still only see my own face. I don't know what's going on with my Zoom. Um, so I can hear you beautifully, but I can't see you. Um, but I just, oh, oh my gosh, there you are. Okay, <laughs> I fixed it. Okay. Um, how wonderful to see you instead of me. So thank you for all of that, those beautiful comments about the book. And I feel seen and I feel loved and I love you. And um, Yes, thank you for asking that question. So I think maybe the best way to answer the question about the entanglements of heterosexuality um, or modern straightness and white supremacy is to go to the second chapter of the book, which is a chapter about the rise of the what I call the heterosexual repair industry. And this industry, um, 
you know, at the core of this industry are various kinds of projects from self-help books to psychological interventions, workshops that straight couples can take um, that are all designed to smooth over that misogyny paradox that we talked about. And when I started looking, I wanted to find what were the earliest sources uh, or the earliest marriage advice books, basically. I wanted to figure out when did the modern self-help uh, movement begin. And when I went into the archive to do that, I was really surprised to discover that all of the earliest marriage advice books had been written by eugenicists, leaders in the eugenics movement. And um, <clears throat> these were people, uh, psychologists, sexologists, a lot of um, family physicians who were very concerned that if white marriages continued to be as brutal as they were, if they continued to be sites of sexual assault <clears throat> and um, and uh, tremendous suffering for white women, that white women would not be invested in having sex with white men, and that this was a serious obstacle for the eugenics movement. And if you're not familiar with the eugenics movement, it was a movement designed to encourage reproduction among people who were perceived to be of good genetic stock. So this meant um, white people, uh, middle and upper class white people, people with um, able-bodied people. Uh, so, so we have to keep in mind that the origins of modern heterosexuality, the very folks who were busy defining what healthy heterosexuality looked like, what healthy straight marriages looked like, had a white supremacist agenda and their investment in bolstering the very concept of the heterosexual, the hetero homo binary and delineating what made for happy heterosexuality was inseparable from their investment in getting white women to continue to invest in white men rather than establish, you know, maybe um, solidarity across racial lines with, with women and women of color. So you can see that play out throughout the entire 20th century. Um, and, I, and I trace that in, in that second chapter of the book. Is that good? No, that's great. I didn't wanna, I didn't know if you were done. <laughs> Because I guess also part of me was thinking that when I was, especially reading that seduction industry chapter, it all felt very white to me. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> like, it just, What's interesting about it is that there are a lot of men of color who participate, but it is, um, the industry itself is primarily anchored in the U.S. and the U.K., and then they send trainers out um, around the globe, including major cities in the global south, to like sort of establish these seduction outposts where um, they basically recruit men of color to understand themselves as heterosexual failures, in part because they want a kind of woman that who isn't available to them. And I gather based on the way the industry works that that woman, that idealized woman is a white blonde woman. And so what happens for men of color who can afford the highest price tag in this industry is they get kind of toured around Europe, well, the, the US and Europe to cities where they can practice their skills at learning how to seduce white women. I was very naively, you know, and one of my colleagues pointed out that this was my, this was my own whiteness showing, but I, I guess I was naively surprised by how many of these men still wanted what to my mind is just the most predictable stereotype of what would be an attractive woman. I mean, I, I, I guess like our context now is such that um, when I think about what is sexy, I think about Beyonce. <laughs> so I was just like, what, 
what's going on with these men? But so many of these men, um, you know, they came to these workshops with a lot of, um, with kind of a, a sense of mourning or loss that the women who were available to them were not at all who they wanted nor who they thought that they deserved or would be able to attract. And they were heartbroken by this. And so they're offered by this industry, um, which normalizes that failure, basically normalizes the failure and says, you know, uh, these are a learned set of skills. You're not born with them. And so it's not your fault that you don't have them. We can teach you these skills. You deserve to have those young, those women who are 20 years younger than you. You deserve to have blonde white women. And we're going to teach you how to get them. And then we're even going to take you to the cities where you can access them. Yeah. And it's interesting that you bring up these folks kind of moving about the globe, right? And um, because I wanted to ask you something about what I see as these um, transnational gestures in the book. Um, and so I was hoping specifically that you might talk a little bit about what potentially might be the kind of transnational character of the tragedy of heterosexuality. So for the benefit of folks who haven't read the book yet, um, take for example, you know, in the book, Jane cites uh, Najma Badi's work on the 19th century development of heterosexuality in Iran. Um, and Jane goes on to say, quote, you know, there's evidence across the globe of men's resistance to loving their wives and other women partners and of the historically and culturally varied manifestations of women's subjugation by men in marriage. Um, later, Jane notes that the trash, otherwise known as men are from Mars, women are from Venus, has been published in Korean, Chinese, Japanese, Japanese, Spanish, Indonesian, what else am I missing? Arabic, Lisa, and French, right? So also as we move through the book, um, Jane explicitly says of the dating and seduction coaches that, you know, their industries are quote, also transnational and imperialist ones. Um, so I guess, again, I wanna ask what knowledge might be gained by further exploring the transnational character of the tragedy and misogyny paradox? And are there limitations to such an analysis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you again, you're such a good question. Um, so one piece of the answer to that question has to do with the imperialist export of, of global North conceptions of sexual orientation, of heterosexuality in particular, of um, the psychology of attraction. So part of what's happening also in that chapter or, or in the seduction industry is the development of a social science of heterosexual desire that um, the seduction coaches promise they will deliver to men. Again, part of that mastery of heterosexual seduction techniques, some of which they pull from the US military and from psyops training and so forth to figure out you know, how to seduce women without them knowing they're being seduced. And so all of this, you know, the, the proliferation of heterosexual repair tactics are being circulated globally by these, corp these seduction corporations that um, are, uh, developing home bases, um, we might call them occupations uh, throughout the, the global south. But the other piece is that um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Najma, Najma Badi's book because that book was in many ways one of the primary inspirations for this book. What she's arguing there is that in Iran in the 19th century, um, Iranian, the, the Iranian state became aware of European attachments to a hetero homo binary and to European constructions of heterosexuality as something new that, what, that required men to form their primary attachments with women and to love women. And that that was in conflict with how Iranian men understood love. Um, in, in some ways, it really reminds me of um, 
Jonathan Katz's work and then people who have looked at homosexuality in ancient Rome, highlighting that, you know, in many times and places, it has been understood that women are such were such degraded figures that it would be impossible for men to authentically love them or desire them. Um, that those attachments could only be possible between men. Women were property, women were partners in reproduction, women produced male, you know, heirs for men, but they were not um, worthy of men's authentic desire or love. And this, according to Afsana Najmabadi, is what was happening in Iran. So she's really interested in mapping all of the ways that Iran, following the lead from Europe, wanting to appear to be modernized, um, is transitioning from one mode of uh, relationality between men and women to another and to the one that that is associated with um, modern heterosexuality. So I guess the other part of what we might what we might discover if we are mapping this transnationally is to look at that transitional moment, how in each particular, you know, in each uh, context, each national context, modern heterosexuality takes hold and what that transition looks like. This book definitely is centered on the United States for sure, but I, I think it's uh, important to recognize that the inspiration for me for this book about the U.S. is re really was looking at what happened in Iran and wanting to ask the question, what did that transition look like here in the U.S.? Yeah, that's great. And I think a lot of this was to say, you know, to compliment you in that I, even though it's focused on the U.S., I really appreciated the transnational gestures and specifically just even in the citational practice inciting, you know, especially feminists who are not from the U.S. Um, and, and I really appreciated that in my reading of the text. Um, I, Angela, can I just say something about that just to highlight, you know, one of the beautiful, one of the many beautiful things that Sarah Ahmed has offered us is a, a feminist citational practice. And, um, and so it was so delicious with this book to see how few men and how few white feminists I could cite, you know, what kind of different, um, genealogy could I work with here? And so uh, this is really a lesbian feminist book. Um, leaning very heavily on lesbian feminists of color. Right, that's great. Right, and again, this is why my kind of opening remarks, I talked about how much I appreciate, whether it's you talking about dyke methods or just really trying to shake up a lot of these epistemological and methodological con conditions or traditions rather that are rooted in white supremacy and you know settler colonialism and all of that. Um, now I save the best for the last. Um, no, the, I appreciated all the responses thus far. Um, in the book, you begin by asking, are straight women okay? Absolutely not, right? And I think it's not only suffering and misery that I wanna talk a little bit about, it's anger and rage, right? Like, so if you look also at contemporary culture, in the book, you have this iconic image of Angela Bassett from Waiting to Exhale, where she burns all of her philandering husband's clothes right in the car, right? Um, if you look at popular music, right, like Carrie Underwood is going to take a slugger to both headlights and slap the tires of her cheating boyfriend. Um, I will resist the urge to sing badly here. You know, Jasmine Sullivan is going to bust the windows of her terrible man's car, you know, right open. So I say that to say, I think we also need to account not only for their misery, but for how they channel their rage and if they can rechannel it into feminism. You know, and then finally you write, um, quote, queer observers of heterosexual misery don't always know how to feel about straight women's suffering. Um, and to be honest, I kind of feel frustrated and oftentimes baffled, right? And if y'all, I'm being conscious of time, but if y'all indulge me in an anecdote for a second, um, I live in the suburbs of New York. And one morning, you know, we're all standing at the bus stop, all mothers waiting at the 
uh, or, you know, waiting at the bus stop for our kids to come off. And I'm kind of on the periphery, but there are all these like straight moms talking about their husbands. Um, and one of the mothers who, you know, my kid Jordan plays with, with her children. And so I know her well, I'm really fond of her, but she starts in on her husband and she's like, they're talking about how they have to get up in the morning with their husbands. And so this one woman is talking about, she's like, look, I have to get up with him in the morning because if I didn't get up with him, like he couldn't find his boots for his, by himself. Like I have to be able to find these things for him. And, you know, because um, her kids play, you know, or, or have before COVID um, played with my son, like I've heard her on many occasions refer to her husband as her fourth child. And, and I think about, especially this moment with the boots, right? Like I have this image of her standing there like with the boots and the lunch, right? Like waiting for him um, to get ready. And as Jane notes in the book, it was almost like a badge of honor for her to fulfill this role. Um, and so I, I promise there's a question in here coming, but men, especially white men, take up so much goddamn space in the world. And frankly, even in this book, and, and I don't mean that as a critique per se, but as a call to talk more about straight women's suffering and rage, right? Like, and even Jane notes in the book, and I wrote down this quote, I wrote this book out of solidarity with straight women, but the further into the project I went, the more my attention shifted to straight men. And so I understand intellectually why women put up with this foolishness, right? Patriarchy and systems, right? Like I get it, but at the same time, I don't. Right, and, and I'm a feminist, so I don't want to attack these women, but how on earth do we save them, right? And, and I'm not asking them to rebuke their sexual or romantic desires and join our softball team, but how do you think deep heterosexuality helps these women? How can insights from queer culture help them, right? I wanna discuss what women need to do because a strategy that hinges solely upon cis men doing better, well, guess what? We read the book and we know how that's gonna go. <laughs> well, I, I think I might be a little more hopeful um, than you are about <laughs> cis straight men. I, I don't know, maybe I'm just eternally optimistic about people's desire to um, live their best lives and I guess I feel like straight men are living you know they're they're so emotionally deficient that they're kind of living like half a life um and so I want I think if we can get them to see that um then they will be invested too for me there's so much overlap here between the work that we do um, as white anti-racist organizers to teach people to see the their to teach white people to see the way that they too should be invested in undoing white supremacy um, because their own humanity hinges on it. And so I want I want that for men, for straight men. And I, I do, I think it's possible. And I think at some level, straight men know that they need that. Um, but I guess I wanna go, you said so many great things and I have like a little list of notes here. Um, so what can straight women do? Um, I think what straight women can do is, um, detach from, disinvest in uh, the, the romantic suffering that um, we have talked about quite a bit already. So one of the things that's really frustrating for queer people about straight women, and this is the subject of chapter four of the book, is how much straight women, how much time straight women spend complaining about their relationships with men. <laughs> and doing nothing about it. <laughs> and so uh, that's really alienating for a lot of queer people. And um, it, it just often raises the question like, oh my God, you know, why, why are you staying there? And 
clearly there are reasons that women are staying there. And so I think women owning that there's a calculus here, that there's enough that's miserable about those relationships, but there's apparently enough that's good to keep them there. Because they know by now that queerness is an alternative. They know that celibacy is an alternative. You know, they know what the alternatives are. So there's something that's still pulling women towards men. And I think if straight women were um, pushed to be more accountable about what that is, that that would p potentially help um, straight women to make a heterosexuality that is their own rather than one that's sort of defaulting into heteronormativity. So what this might look like, I did get a group of straight women, you know, like radical feminist straight women friends agreed to have drinks with me. And a few drinks in, I was like, no, but seriously though, how could you, you know, you know, men are trash, <laughs> what's going on here? And they said something, you know, in some cases they said, look, like I, I love the way men smell. I love, you know, the thickness of a man's body. I love um, the size of men's bodies, the hardness of men's bodies. I love a hairy body. And it was really affirming for me as a lesbian because the more they talked, the more nauseous I was. But I could see that they, you know, this really you know, this is an embodied desire. So if that embodied desire is so strong, you know, that you're still drawn to men, then I think that's actually something to work with. It's a foundation. And part where we might want to work with that is to recognize, well, you can get that. You can have all of those things and you don't actually have to hold his boots. You know, you don't actually have to make his lunch. So kind of parsing out what do women get from heterosexuality and what do they not get? I think that's a really important thing for, um, for straight women to do. And I also want to say that I, uh, though I love a good Angela Bassett um, or Beyonce car on fire scene um, as much as anyone, I, I think sometimes those kinds of um, representations function a little bit like rage porn for straight women. They're in the, in the same way that we often will go to the movies and watch, or, or watch a show like, I don't know, Alias or whatever, where you have a woman who's just constantly like um, shooting down men with a semi-automatic weapon or, you know, like just a badass who's killing men right and left. Um, what is it? It's Killing Eve. That's what this is for me now. Uh, it's not actually a reflection of reality. It's not actually reality. And so one of the things that I think straight women do, and probably that just all people do, is we take that rage that we feel and cannot express because we're in a really constrained context. And one thing we can do with it is watch these fantasy images of women enacting, you know, the, the violence that we might wish to enact or escaping in a way we might wish to, to, to escape. Yeah. And I think, okay, so I feel like for those who know me in the audience, I'd be really remiss if I didn't ask this question. Um, but what about straight sex? There's also this moment towards the end of the book where you quote that, that bully bloggers piece that I wrote about straight sex. And like, it reminds me folks in that piece, I talk a little bit about somebody that I know, um, you know, a straight woman who like described having sex with her partner like on a regular basis and basically saying like, I know he needs this. And sometimes I lay there and, you know, he's having sex with me, you know, and she's like, I'm just laying there thinking about the laundry and thinking about when he's going to be done so I can get on with my life and thinking, you know, like, wow, like how sad that is. Like, I, I want you to have better sex. I want you to have more orgasms. I want your pleasure to be the focal point of your sexual relations, you know? So how do we help them with that too? Or like how, do, what, you know, what's your take on, you know, the actual sex in these relationships? Because again, I know so much of this project was about interrogating straight culture, but I also want to talk about straight sex. Yeah. Well, I just saw someone ask the question, isn't that kind of sex rape though? And um, I just wanna answer that because I think one thing that we need to um, get a little 
smarter about is the distinction between sexual assault and unwanted sex. And, um, you know, so sexual assault to my mind is sex that happen that you don't consent to. Um, whereas unwanted sex, we know that straight women consent to unwanted sex all the time. Um, they do that in marriage. They do that in relationships. They don't really feel like it. They don't really want to, but they consent to it, maybe even initiate it because they want to get it over with or because they know that's sort of the contract in their relationship. So I think that's an important distinction to make and it helps us to see um, how much unwanted sex is actually happening. Um, I think, so how do we help straight people have better sex? I think we have been doing this, especially lesbians. So the um, queer feminist pornographer, Tristan Terramino, um, often does the lecture circuit. And, and one of the lectures she would give in my lesbian studies class is um, basically mapping the history of lesbian interventions into bad heterosexual sex. And she talks about all the ways that has happened. But one of them, I think the most compelling ways um, is that lesbians were really, or queer people, dykes, were really at the forefront of uh, developing these um, feminist sex stores where, you know, Good Vibration, um, Toys and Babeland, you, you can all name the other ones, I'm forgetting what they are. Yes. And these were places where, you know, they were well lit, they were clean, they invited all kinds of people of all kinds of genders to come in. And when you walked into one of those, what basically was happening was that like a bunch of dykes were working there and they were doing a lot of education of straight people on how to have good sex. And, you know, we know that Dykes were very involved in the development of bent over boyfriend and did a lot of work to teach straight women, you know, how do you strap on and fuck a man, you know? And so I think we actually have a long history of this happening. And it's just that it's a slippery slope between co-optation um, or, uh, I, I guess I do worry a little bit. Like, I don't want to see the TV show that's like dyke eye for the straight guy. I don't want to see that. So. But I do think there can be like a, a lineage of sexual information and gratitude that could be really productive. I mean, the other thing I say, you know, there are just so many examples of the way that straight people and queer people relate differently to, to sex. Um, you know, one is that if you think about the history of butch femme, and if you think about stone butches, um, Butch femme couples were often ridiculed as people who were simply mimicking heterosexuality. But one of the ways that we know that they weren't doing that is that it was very common for butches to identify as stone and for their whole um, erotic life to be oriented toward the pleasure of the femme that they were with. They didn't even wanna to be touched. So what stone means, they wanted to provide pleasure for the femme they were with. There is no corollary in straight the straight world. I mean, I'm sure there's like a few men in, here and there who are like, don't touch me. I just want to go down on you, but certainly not enough to form a community. So these kinds of things. I mean, the other thing I talk about the, in the book is the weird obsession with tightness, like t the tight vagina that in straight culture, whereas in queer culture, you know, we often get around and brag about how capacious our orifices are, like how much we can get in there. The more you can get in there, you know, like the more celebrated you are. So the, there are some really important ways that queer people have reconfigured the body and reconfigured sex practices that I think straight people should be paying attention to. Thank you so much for all of that. And I just want to respond to something in the chat that I am pretty positive Jane will agree with me on, because I don't think any of this was meant to say that there aren't queers who have terrible sex or who have unwanted sex or that all, all the straights have terrible sex, right? I don't think that that was the intent um, of any of you know that particular exchange. Um, but I feel like we're almost at four. So Crystal, do we want to switch to sure. audience questions and stuff? 
Sure. Well, Angela and Jane, thank you so, so much. Um, I mean, I was just looking at the chat and just so lively in terms of the comments and the questions that came up. So there's a whole litany of questions. I'm going to try my very best to get through all the questions. And if folks do have um, sort of other questions, please feel to share them on the chat. Um, so I'll ask the first question. This is from Dustin. And Dustin, feel free to... Um, add onto the question um, if you want to. So Dustin asked, and this is a question for Jane, how do you see or describe the connection between eugenics and the biological quote unquote, born this way argument? Mm. Mm. That is a good question. Um, I mean, we know that um, one of the reasons that so many gay and lesbian people are attached to the born this way argument is the presumption that if homosexuality is congenital, then, um, then straight people must accept us, that then we have, um, we're granted certain kinds of human rights by birthright uh, because of these immutable differences that we can't do anything about. And it makes sense because this is sort of the civil rights framework in the United States that if that if you um, have an immutable difference, you can't change it even if you wanted to, then you um, um, have a legitimate claim to human rights based on that form of difference. But we also know that new developments in um, like reproductive technology and genetic testing and so forth have enabled straight people to find out whether the fetus might have one of these um, markers for same-sex desire and in some cases try to alter those markers. So it's interesting, I guess just, th I don't have a good answer to that question other than that what it makes me think about is the way that I think um, gay and lesbian people thought that they were going to circumvent uh, certain kinds of discrimination by making an argument about um, the genetic link to homosexuality, when in fact, now we know that's being you know, picked up and put to eugenicist um, uses. And Angela, I also feel free to you know, chime in on if um, a question speaks to you. Um, so this next question is from Isaac. And Isaac um, asks, uh, many women don't know um, they are gay until they're older. Um, do any of the cishet marriage advice books ask couples to wonder if one or both of them may be gay? This is such a common thing in none of the books I've read um, as a pretend straight person trying to quote unquote heal my straight marriage even hinted at that possibility. Mm. Mm. Did Crystal, did that person identify as a pretend straight person? That uh, um, yeah, so Isaac, I don't know if you're still on if you wanna add anything um, to the question. I'm just reading um, the question as it was shared on the chat. So I'm not sure if Isaac is still with us. Um, well, Isaac, chime in if you want. I don't know that might, maybe that feels kind of exposed or something, but um, I have never encountered that either. I think, you know, you imagine picking up a book in the, in the bookstore designed to help you save your marriage. And then it says, or maybe you're actually gay. <laughs> that would be such a radical um, new development in, uh, in self-help books. Um, it is absolutely true that there is a high rate of uh, what I think people are calling late in life lesbianism. And often those folks will say that um, part of what happened for them was that they left a very dissatisfying marriage. And they were at now a time in their life when it became possible to imagine um, choosing something very different. And I, you know, personally, I had a friend as a kid. This is one of the kids in my neighborhood who, you know, used to play lesbian sex games with me as a kid. And then later, 
became sort of had sort of a homophobic reaction to it and then and married a man and they had kids and we did discuss it um when we ran into each other but it was sort of like remember how you, we did that weird lesbian stuff and i was like yeah i do remember it and then um I'm, i just thought like wow you know here she is living such a straight life and then a few years later i get a facebook message from her that says hey so i got a divorce and maybe i now do want to be a lesbian <laughs> so, do you have any advice for me so i was really happy to be a resource for that person i think um uh we're always waiting for you you know if you if you want to join our team just send me an email um angela did you want to add anything you don't have to i'm just you know um no, I was just going to say that I think I was actually just typing in the chat. I think Isaac was actually going to speak. So. Oh, I'm so sorry. Isaac, did you want to share? I'm so sorry about that. I didn't see that for some reason. Or Isaac, I think you might be on mute. Hmm. So we actually can't hear. Okay, so your audio isn't working for some reason. I don't know if you want to share in chat. Oh, okay, so I'm not sure if Isaac is with us. Uh, or there is Isaac. Um, so Isaac, we can't hear you, but feel free if you want to chime in, please, um, you know, use a chat function if you would prefer that. Um, so the next question is from Madeline. And Madeline asks, maybe outside the scope of your research or project, but when, where does this straight misery start? How is it learned? Um, I mean, beyond what we know and work against. And Madeline, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to your question. Um, I, I'm sorry, I was in my bed. No, um, no, no, no worries. Uh, uh, yeah, just, uh, I just, um, just fascinated by this. This is so excellent. I already bought the book 10 minutes ago. Um, but just like when, I don't know, when it starts, you know, we're all, you know, raising, those of us raising kids, you know, working hard against, you know, these kinds of things. But, um, but uh, you know, it's in there. It's in the soup that we sort of live in or whatever. And I just wondered if there's anything beyond the obvious, you know, pink, blue, favoriting, favoriting like boys in classes and just kind of of prioritizing them over everything uh, that you've discovered in this or you have thoughts about. Yes, thank you. Have you ever heard, did you hear as a kid or have you ever heard the phrase that, um, you know, when, a, when there's a situation in which a little boy is bullying or hits a little girl and then maybe an adult might say to them, you know, he, he hit you because he likes, like he he likes you. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, the misery, the heterosexual misery starts the moment that children are sexualized or heterosexualized by adults. Um, so one of the things that adults often do with children is they take their opposite sex uh, um, friendships, you know, children ha often will spend time with you know, with kids of all genders, and then they sexualize what those relationships, we really don't know what those relationships mean for children, they might be a friendship, they might be um, that, you know, one child is actually self identifying with the gender of another child, even if that's not the gender they were assigned at birth. So, um, so I think the that that um, those first moments in which heterosexuality is imposed on a child. And then I see other people writing in chat about just the gender binary itself, the violence of the gender binary itself. Mm -hmm. I think that's all part of where the misery begins because we know that these are really ill-fitting uh, categories and sexual framework, gender and sexual frameworks that are imposed on kids, whether they actually resonate for children or not. The other thing that your question makes me think about is that um, 
you know, when we think about what causes sex, sexual orientation, people are very interested in, you know, what causes homosexuality, for instance. And um, I, I think something we don't talk about enough, but that we need to consider is that children are very observant of the social world. And one thing they might be observing is the tragedy of heterosexuality itself. And I think we cannot discount the possibility that children look around and realize that heterosexuality often looks like shit, you know, that it's not actually something that they want. Um, and that this could be one of um, the, the moments or one of the factors that contributes to a person's cultivation of queerness in their life. Great. Right. Um, okay, so I'm just continue to add to the question list. So I'll try to get through as many as possible. So the next question comes from Rena. Um, and hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I'm so sorry if I'm not. Um, so given that many heterosexual men feel pretty good about their current predicament, how do we encourage or incentivize them to change uh, besides having individual women break up with them? And I'm coming to, um, at this as a legal scholar of online dating apps. And, and Arena, did you want to add to that at all? Or you don't have to, I just want to offer that. Thank you. No, I think that's generally it because I, I, I'm finding in the work that I'm doing that that question sort of ends up underlying so much. And somebody asked in the chat earlier, you know, are there any straight men here? And, and maybe there are a few, right? But sometimes the people who need a book the most are the least likely to read it. And so I'm worried about it happening with this. And you know, I really, really enjoyed the book, by the way. So thank you. Thank you. I, I do know that there are some straight men who are reading it and some of my, you know, I have just like a handful, I can count them on one hand, my, my feminist men BFFs, but they're doing the best that they can to get the book out because clearly it would be really great to have this, to be in conversation with straight men about this. I mean, I would be really interested. You said it seems to be working for men. And I think um, in the way that exploiting someone else's free labor works for us, it is working for, you know, works for people, it's working for men. But I think at another level, it's really not working for men. And that's why we see men spending $3,000 for, you know, the, the seduction coaching, for instance. I think a lot of men believe um, because they have internalized some of the post-feminist backlash rhetoric that women now control sexuality or that they're sexual gatekeepers and that men are really disempowered around heterosexuality. I think men feel um, like they are often confused about uh, you know, how, what it looks like to not be creepy, um, you know, how to express their sexual desire without being offensive. Um, I think a lot of men are unsettled by the feeling that women don't feel safe with them. Um, and, you know, men are often encouraged to access feminism light by thinking about the experiences of their mothers and their sisters and their daughters. I think there's a lot of that kind of circulating around men that we can uh, tap into to, to, to make some interventions. Um, but the thing is that men, straight men themselves have to do a lot of, of this organizing work because straight men are going to be most effective, I think, at getting other men to listen to them. And so I'm hoping we'll see more of an effort on the part of feminist straight men to um, not relate to their feminist politics as a, an, an individual politic, but to start building some organizational infrastructure so that this kind of work can be done at the organizational level. I don't think we're going to see much movement unless that happens. 
Okay, um, great. Thanks so much, Jane. Um, so the next question comes from Anthony. Um, I know Anthony had to leave um, a little bit early. So Anthony asks, um, you know, are there lessons from understanding why straight women support straight men that help us understand why people support Trump? Such an interesting question. Um, I don't know why I can't shake the idea that there's something analogous to that. Yeah. Um... So I did get on Women for Trump website the other night because I was thinking, okay, it is time for, under, for us to understand better than we do um, why it is that white women um, we're, why we did not, why our organizing efforts did not move white women over the last four years. Um, there wasn't, we didn't see a lot of progress there and what it might look like to have a gender specific strategy um, for reaching them. Um, and, you know, what it looked like to me in looking at all of their uh, description of, of their work um, is that um, they are driven primarily by safety and that the concept of safety has both um, a white supremacist genealogy and a, a patriarchal genealogy. So they, um, of course, you know, are compelled by Trump's whole law and order rhetoric, which is a cover for racism um, or stand-in, but also, I think part of what's operating there is what um, um, uh, Ken Diodi, um called the patriarchal bargain, that basically women uh, feel that, you know, they're constrained in what they can do about patriarchy. So they're working under the, or they are constrained. It's not that they feel they're constrained, they are constrained. So they're working with what they have to negotiate with men to give something so that they can get something. And for many women, that negotiation looks like offering a degree of subservience um, in exchange for some protection. I think what one intervention that we could make with, with white women in particular is to, in the same way that we're slowly um, chipping away at the notion that policing makes us safer, even though we all were raised with that idea that the police make us safer, that when presented with the evidence, we get to see that in fact, um, you know, when women call the police, they are often more traumatized by their interactions with the police. We also know that police don't make undocumented women or trans women or black women safer. So this idea, this link between safety and policing, it's just a flawed connection. So we might be able to similarly um, validate that so many women are feeling unsafe and that they're really craving a patriarchal figure to make them safe. We might validate that feeling of, of not being safe and then expose that in fact attaching yourself to a patriarchal figure isn't what delivers safety, that there are other models for what safety for women could look like. Okay, um, so the next question, so we probably have time for uh, maybe two to three more questions, and I'm so sorry for everyone that we won't get through. Um, Jane, I don't know if you'll be open to sharing your email address and folks can email you directly as well, so I really apologize. There are, just, there are so many questions, um, which is wonderful, so let me get to the next one. So the next question is from Ken, and again, Ken, please feel, to, feel, to, uh, feel free to elaborate if you want to, um, if I'm missing anything. So you um, noted, I'm curious what Jane thinks about the connection um, is across a radical um, lesbian feminist politic and critique of heterosexuality, where women tor uh, women towards turn each other, 
or women turn towards each other, I think, um, versus um, MGTOW movement where men turn towards each other um, without sex. I've been thinking about this in relation to my dissertation on sex dolls, where sex dolls are sometimes marketed as a way to get away from feminist women society and uses a parallel form of argument. So hopefully I captured your question, Ken. Ken, I know about men going their own way, but I think I heard Crystal say sex stalls, and I don't know. Sex, do sex dolls. Oh, sex sorry, dolls. Sorry, sex okay. dolls. I'm <laughs> visualizing something very cool. Um, that apparently doesn't exist. Okay. Um, sex dolls. Can you just then read that again now that I know that we're talking about sex dolls? Yeah, and, sure. I, and I'm, I'm sorry. I think okay. I might have had a typo in there. I apologize. No, I it's okay. Go ahead. I it too quickly. Um, but yeah, so in my research on the sex doll community, what I found was that a lot of people think that the men who have sex dolls are young men who can't get sex in the sort of normal heterosexual way of going to bars or parties or whatever. And what I found was that um, most of the men are actually not that. They're actually older. They're like 50s, 60s, and they've had kids. They've um, been divorced. And so they see sex dolls as a way to move away from heterosexual, or well, still identify as heterosexual, but move away from women. And so their justification is often like, well, you know, lesbians have their vibrators and their dildos and lesbians have decided that men are bad um, and it's okay for them to just give up on men. So we're giving up on women and we have sex dolls. And so a lot of them are MGTOW and it's interesting that they're kind of parroting feminists um, but are, are decidedly not feminists. Mm -hmm. um, well, I... I think both of those examples, the men go their own way and the, the men in their 50s, which actually is who I would have imagined had sex dolls, um, are um, quite aligned with what I'm arguing in this book, which is that men don't actually like women very much. Straight men don't like women very much. And um, they have to work to reconcile that with their heterosexuality. And there are different ways to reconcile that. Sometimes men get into marriages and they just resent the woman that they're with and don't respect her and don't listen to her and expect her to serve them. And I think we see now men organizing around this sense that women have failed them and that they never really liked women in the first place. So it's not actually worth it to be with women in men going their own way. And apparently also in some of the discourse surrounding the sex doll, I didn't know there was sex doll community, but um, that, doesn't, that doesn't surprise me. And it's interesting. I mean, I agree with them, yeah have a vibrator, have a sex doll. I, I, I don't want those men to return to um, animate women. <laughs> to sentient women. <laughs> um, okay, so the next question. So um, Ken, hopefully that um, answers your question or addresses your, the question that you have, great. Uh, so the next question is from Jay. Jay asks, how might heterosexual romantic suffering and sacrifice be informed by culturally Christian notions of romanticized sacrifice. So Jay, feel free to also add or elaborate if you want to. Go ahead, Jay. Oh, oh, Jay, go ahead. Yeah, um, so I was actually thinking about uh, this idea of like the romanticized suffering of the Christ on the cross that kind of gets perpetuated into contemporary life um, and the extreme amount of self-help books that you see for Protestant women um, and like the men are from Mars, women are from Jupiter kind of also writing that happens in, in these like Protestant circles specifically aimed at women. Uh, yes. To me, that seems, I didn't focus on that in the book, but it feels like that's a pretty self-evident connection, which is that if you already have an ethos of, uh, if, you, if you have already linked uh, morality to 
personal sacrifice. Um, and especially if though that um, Christian ideology is linked maybe to other components of one's identity, like working class identity, there's often a, a strong attachment to um, self-sacrifice or suffering as what builds character and makes for a well-lived life, um, then I think the heterosexual suffering certainly just um, is consistent with those impulses. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, possibly our last question um, is from Sherry. And Sherry, please feel free to also elaborate if you want to. So I'm going to read your um, incisive comment here. So Sherry, um, Sherry, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Again, I apologize if I'm not. First of all, thank you so much for bringing up this discussion. I feel it is sorely lacking in both academic and activist discourses, especially as a bi-feminist activist and scholar. I see so much value in the understanding that being queer and having multiple options can open up possibilities and exits from heteronormativity, both for bi women and femmes and for their cis male partners. I wonder if you could speak to that, i.e. the possibilities that your suggestions might open up in the context of bi-feminism and bi-epistemology. It's a great question. Um, yes, so I, so I think um, where I'm going to go with that is just to be honest and say that um, I have not studied by women, but I have a good number of by women in my life. So I'm gonna um, speak anecdotally here, which is that many of the by women that I know, and this is not a representative sample because these are women now in their in their forties or older, um, have a life that is anchored in. Um, queer subculture when they're in same-sex relationships and then a life that's pretty anchored in straight culture when they're in relationships with men. And I think that it's hard to do um, something other than that because, because of biphobia and, and a number of factors that um, result in there being not so much of um, a politicized bisexual identity that would allow people to really inhabit that that um, a politic of bisexuality regardless of the gender of the person they're in relationship with. So I know, for instance, a lot of bi identified women who are married to men and they're in monogamous relationships with men, and they really struggle to um, to to figure out ways to. Um, have their queerness recognized in those marriages and just generally and, and in their life. And they struggle with what it means to move in queer public space because now they're married to a man and they have children or whatever might be going on there. So the reason I'm saying all of this is because I think um, in, in the same way that I'm attempting to offer lesbian feminism to straight couples that I think many of these same possibilities might actually feel potentially liberating to buy women who are who are anchored in relationships with men that I, I guess where I'm what I'm striving toward is to figure out not how to queer heterosexual relationships but how to um, imbue them with lesbian feminist values. And that this is something that any person, any woman, regardless of her sexual orientation, who is in a sexual relationship with a man might struggle to know how to do. Great, thank you so much, Jane. Um, Jane, are you okay with one more question? Yes. Okay, there's a lot of questions. So this is, so again, I'm trying to, um, 
stick with questions just for the audience, but so many great comments um, offered. Um, so this is from Carlos and Carlos notes, thank you for your talk, um, Dr. Ward. This is really excellent and generative. My question is, what if, what is, if there is one, the role of compulsory monogamy in the tragedy of heterosexuality? I think I missed it. What is... Okay, so uh, what is the role, if any, of um, compulsory monogamy in the tragedy of heterosexuality? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if I have anything smart to say that's not just the obvious about that, the obvious thing to say about that. Um, I mean, it, it seems again, like pretty self-evident to me that one of the norms within heteronormativity is monogamy um, and, uh, and queer activists and queer um, sex educators have been trying to intervene in that for a long time because we know that one of the things that straight people do is cheat on each other and then get real upset about it and that if there was a way for um, straight people to recognize all of the um, all of the poly possibilities in their in their relationships from the get-go that this might circumvent some of the suffering that straight people experience um, so absolutely that but also I don't know um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure how much I think non-monogamy would intervene in the um, some of the gendered suffering that I have described in the book, the misogyny, because we know that um, many people struggle to do non-monogamy ethically, in part because you know we're not we're not given a lot of models for how to do that, but also because we're all messy and we bring all of our other baggage into non-monogamy. And so when we um, kind of let straight people loose practicing non-monogamy, and that includes um, straight men, a lot of those same power dynamics are going to play themselves out, you know, in that context too. So um, I would be concerned about that. Great. Um, so I know that was a lot of questions, Jane. Thank you so much. And again, um, let me share Jane's email address here in the chat. If you didn't have a um, chance to have your answer um, or your question answered, I'm so sorry about that. Um, so before we um, transition to a closing, is there anything, um, Angela or Jane, that you want to add? Maybe that wasn't, um, you know, a question that wasn't asked or something that emerged um, during the conversation. Um, I would like to ask if it's possible we copy the chat because I didn't get to see if so much was happening there that I didn't get to see. I don't know yes. if that is possible. I think so. Yeah, I think there's a, um, let me see if I can get a copy of this. So it's under CI, the Center for Ideas and Society, um, but I think they should get a copy of the chat. And I, I copied all the questions. But. Awesome, thank you so much, Crystal. Yes. And I put my Twitter handle in there if anybody wants um, to connect with me there. And I also have an Instagram page for this book that I think is funny. I don't know if you'll think it's funny, but it's just um, at the tragedy of heterosexuality or tragedy of heterosexuality. It's one of those on Instagram and it's just a lot of the what's been happening with the book, so. It is funny. But I'm by it. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, you know, I want to just so much gratitude for both Angela and Jane for joining us for this incredible talk, just so rich. Um, thank you for all of you also for tuning in again. Please do read um, Jane's book if you have a chance. Um, so just before we transition off, I want to say that our last um, series or list, last talk of this um, sort of book series will be in January and we'll send an email out um, through um, the Center for Ideas and Society. It's January 21st um, and so we'll be with uh, Professor Brandon Andrew Robinson and their book coming out to the 
Streets, LGBTQ Youth Experiencing Homelessness in Dialogue with Professor Terrell Winder from UC Santa Barbara. So again, thank you to everyone. It was so lovely seeing all of you and hopefully um, you know, we can be in touch in other ways. And also please join us for uh, Professor Robinson's talk. Thank you everyone.